It's been three years since Indian-controlled Kashmir lost its autonomy. We'll look at the fallout and whether New Delhi's decision has helped Kashmiris or Prime Minister Narendra Modi's political ambitions. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Indian-administered Kashmir. For many Kashmiris, August 5th, 2019 was a day of confusion and concern as the decisions being made in India's capital would dramatically change the landscape of their own backyard. On that day, Indian troops marched into the Kashmir Valley and around the clock curfew was imposed. Local political leaders and activists were rounded up. Cable TV, phone lines and the internet were all cut off. And for months, food and other supply chains were disrupted. All because a decades-old amendment to India's constitution called Article 370 was revoked. That controversial move had a number of consequences. Among them, it revoked Indian-administered Kashmir's special autonomous status. That canceled the region's constitution, which banned the state from making its own laws. And after decades of land protection, non-Kashmiris could now buy properties in Indian-administered Kashmir. Amid the chaos, Prime Minister Narendra Modi celebrated what he and his supporters deemed a major victory. Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh can be an inspiration for India's prosperity and peace. It can greatly contribute in India's development journey. We should all make an effort to restore their old glorious days. The new arrangement is a result of these efforts and it will work directly in the citizens' interest. Well, it also worked in favor of Modi's political interests. His Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJP, has long pushed a Hindu nationalist agenda and lobbied for years to repeal Article 370. An earlier effort was rebuffed by the Supreme Court of Indian-administered Kashmir. In 2015, the justices ruled that the article could not be abrogated, repealed, or even amended. India's Supreme Court echoed that decision a few years later. But as the BJP grew in power, their leaders were able to push through legislation that superseded the authority of the judges, enraging many Kashmiris. We don't accept the annulment of Article 370. Even if we have to sacrifice our lives, we will keep fighting till the end. We want to say to Modi, do whatever you want. We will take our freedom at any cost. So three years later, where does Indian-administered Kashmir stand? Let's ask our panel now. And joining us from London is Muzamil Ayub Thakur. He is the director of the Justice Foundation's Kashmir Institute of International Affairs. From New Delhi, we have Rahman Malik. He's a spokesman for the ruling BJP. And in Islamabad is Pakistani British journalist and political commentator Moeed Pirzada. Thanks all so much for being with us. Muzamil, I'm going to start with you. And let's just reassess quickly why New Delhi did this in 2019. You know, some argued initially that it was timed as a distraction from the economic slowdown back then. Others say it was and is actually rooted in this overarching plan to change the demographics of the region. Why do you think autonomy was revoked after 70 years? I think you've touched on it perfectly well, that uh, there is that agenda that the RSS, uh, RSS have had for over a century of Akhand Bharat, the pan-Hindu nation, which stretches uh, beyond Indian, uh, current Indian borders, beyond Pakistan, and even going to the extent of the Middle East, where they claim that this is their territory. Uh, but in, in context of Kashmir, the, the reason for revoking Article 370 35A stems from that purpose, forcing demographic change, forcing secular colonialism, instilling their own people in, in, in Kashmir. Uh, it's been a war on Islam and Muslims particularly. And we've seen that. We've seen Kashmir used as a laboratory experiment for so many years and then those trials being exported to mainland India. We've seen what the Muslims have faced inside India and other minorities. But I guess the real question is, what difference has it made by abrogating 370 35A? Uh, I've mentioned that the purpose of settled colonialism and forcing demographic change. But if the law itself was so abhorrent, why haven't they revoked it in Himachal Pradesh, another mm. state inside India? The reality is Kashmir was and is and will continue to be a disputed territory where the people have been denied their right to self-determination, a right enshrined by the United Nations. We don't want India's false promises of jobs and development. 
They aren't even for the Muslims of Kashmir. The only thing reserved for us are the unmarked graves. Uh, we've rejected every Indian overture for more than 70 years, and there's nothing on God's green earth that can change that. 370 or not, the people of Kashmir will continue to demand freedom from the shackles of Indian tyranny. Okay, Rahman Malik, this is about suppressing the Muslim population of Indian-administered Kashmir. Is that true? It is after the atrocious uh, bunch of lie which is being administered by people who are being remote controlled uh, managed by Pakistan and their ISI and other agendas or or the people who want uh, Ghazwai Hind or the people who are wanting uh, you know to turn India into from a secular state to a Islamic Republic uh, like the PFI and others over here who have given in a call for, for having a Muslim state, uh, India converting into a Muslim state by 2047. And they also say that Turkey is helping them. I do not know whether it is true or not. But let's understand something basic. Human rights were not there in Kashmir. Because of these articles, we have reinstated human rights. We have reinstated RTI, which is right to information. The girls now have equal rights. Uh, development is a primarily uh, agenda which the government is doing. You would be surprised that we've already invested about, after this uh, abrogation of 370, we've already invested more than $5 billion okay. into Kashmir. And we've already made path so that over uh, about 9 to $10 billion of investment into industry and development, uh, industrial and the commercial development can come into Kashmir so that people and the economy of Kashmir. Uh, go ahead very quickly, uh, if Muzami, I may. very like, quickly. Yeah, the, you may the not, progress sir, and development, you said I did not. Uh, allow, yeah, well, I'm, I'm just trying to give I, equal I, I, time I, to everybody. I am watching no. the clock. Uh, Muzami, I'll let you respond. 30 <laughs> seconds, and I'd like to bring um, Moeed back into the, the discussion. Go ahead. The progress and development since 2019 in numbers are as follows. One, more than 1,300 structures damaged, more than 360 encounters, more than 1,100 cordon and search operations. And in the first six months of 2022, this year, more than 190 killings, nearly 170 injured, more than 240 arrests, internet shut down more than 90 times, and more than 110 structures damaged. Okay. Back to you. I, uh, Raman, I know you have a response there, but I'd actually like to play your prime minister. Uh, in order to, to set some more of the stage for the BJP's argument here. And let me let me speak to Moeed, because in line with the same question, I would like to listen uh, to what Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, had to say back in 2019 about some of the benefits uh, that he thought this would bring. Uh, you can comment on, on whether you think it's legitimate. Let's take a listen. The old arrangements during the last 70 years encouraged secessionism. They gave birth to terrorism and nurtured nepotism. And in a way, they made the foundations of corruption and discrimination stronger. And that is why we had to ensure that the women in Kashmir get their rights. For my Dalit brothers and sisters there, they were not getting the rights other Dalits have in the country. And the rights available to the tribal communities in the rest of India should also be available there in Kashmir. So, Moeed, they're protecting Kashmiris from secessionists and terrorists, and they say there is a case to be made for actually helping the cause of equality uh, via raising the standard of living for Dalits. Is there a case for that? No, um, I, I also come from... Uh, my both parents migrated from Srinagar, Kashmir. So I have a long history and I visited the place. Of course, what Prime Minister Narendra Modi is saying is... Uh, is a political statement for the Indian population uh, at large and also for the Western world. Uh, there's no such thing. Um, I think uh, this is, of course, a political rhetoric. I think both India and Pakistan have done blunders and serious mistakes over the past 70 years from 1947, which has created a, human, a huge human tragedy uh, in Kashmir, which is actually a problem for both India and Pakistan. It, um, it diminishes India's uh, India's image worldwide, um, and it of course the Pakistani establishment has done uh, serious, serious mistakes in terms of dealing with India and Kashmir. 
And the solution which they have found on 5th August 2019 is not a solution at all, as Muzammal has pointed out, that similar concessions and facilities or similar kind of legal and constitutional arrangements exist in at least seven or eight other Indian states which have various levels of autonomy Indian, under the Indian constitution. So Article 370 and 35A uh, were essentially the tools, the constitution tools that have led us to a better solution um, maybe as a Kashmiri, I think that uh, the Jammu and Kashmir could have found greater rights, greater greater autonomy inside the framework of the India, and Pakistan could have uh, conceded or acceded to it. I mean, the question is basically how to improve the quality of life. But the 5th August 2019 actions uh, have have locked us into a situation to which there is no real uh, no real solution, right? I mean, it is no solution for Pakistan, no solution for Kashmiris, and no real solution for India. And what Mr. Raman is saying, and what Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, said, I understand that. I mean, that's that's a kind of a thought which they want to uh, believe in it. Uh, but it's, of course, uh, that thought has serious contradiction with the ideology uh, of the RSS and BJP, uh, which has a position not against the Kashmiri Muslims and also has a position against the Indian Muslims. So, and, and this has been continuing uh, from 19, um, ever since. I mean, from the from 1950s onwards, they believe that uh, the, the constitutional status of Jammu and Kashmir uh, as, a, as a separate territory or a, some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of uh, identity uh, within the Indian framework was not acceptable to them. Okay. It was acceptable to Congress, but not acceptable to them. So we have a huge problem. So, Raman Malik, why does so much of the non-Hindu population of India and, and outside India as well remain to be convinced that revoking Article 370 is good for all Kashmiris? First of all, let me put it very clear. The person from Islamabad must understand they are begging for $1.7 billion. And we are talking about a $9 to $10 billion investment coming only into one Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. That is one part. The second is the killing of pundits and other things which uh, happened, and uh, the Chhatri Singh Pura killing or the other killings. They were a proof that the jihadis, the no, fundamental. No, is not no don't the, lie. I, I won't let you lie about Chhatri Singh Pura. I won't let you lie. It was a staged fake encounter. Sorry. Muzamil, I will come acceptable. to you in just a minute. Uh, let, let's get Raman to finish this statement, and I'll let you uh, rebut this. Go ahead, Raman. The killing of uh, Hindus, the killing of Pandits, the killing of Sikhs, and uh, the discrimination against Dalits in Jammu and Kashmir, which was uh, masterminded by Pakistan and people working for Pakistan, is very well known. It is also clear that these terrorists who were there from Huriyat, they had a fantabulous lifestyle. Their kids were educating. Uh, they were getting their education outside India, and they were having fun, wearing uh, branded suits and other things. But the normal Kashmiri was bothered about his two meals, and that is what the problem were. The women did not have rights. Why can a man who gets married to somebody who is a non-Kashmiri have all the property rights, but at the same time, if a woman gets married to somebody who is not a Kashmiri, should not get any property rights. That kind okay, of Okay, let me ask Muzamil that then. I mean, is there a case to be made for the question of equality? We keep hearing that pointed out between women's rights, especially in Kashmir. Are there issues to be addressed that you can admit to in Kashmir about the rights of women? Uh, arguably, or even of the, the marginalized societies, the Dalits, for example, uh, that Prime Minister Narendra Modi was, was pointing out. Go ahead. We don't have Dalits in Kashmir. <laughs> I mean, look, for God's sake, get your, I mean, if you're going to talk about Kashmir, come on the show and, and discuss it with knowledge. Have some basic understanding. I bet you haven't even been to Kashmir. Look, the only change in Kashmir, keep talks, talks about the development and billions of dollars, the only change is an increase in death and destruction. And according to the Indian Express, your own media, not mine, that there's been an increase in death and destruction. NDTV states ninefold increase in police encounters between 2021 and 2022. That's your media. The only achievement is more military domination and further atrocities, just to satisfy the BJP, uh, BJP's anti-Muslim and Kashmiri vote bank. What, what Mr. Raman is doing is typical, I mean, we've heard the phrase uh, um, mansplaining. This is occupier-splaining. 
whitewashing crimes and obfuscating the truth, our history and our sentiments. Stop gaslighting the entire population of Kashmir. Those who've been martyred, denying us our pain, suffering and loss. Those languishing in jails like Asif Sultan, journalists, Asif Sultan, Fahad Shah, Sajad Gul, people that you've tortured, blinded, raped and possibly disappeared, buried in mass graves. No, 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 sir. You will listen to the okay. truth. You are responsible for the death of Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani and Ashraf Sahrai. You continue to illegally detain political prisoners uh, who legitimately represent Kashmir, like Masrat Alam, Asya Andrabi, Qasim Fakul, Yasin Malik, who's on trial right now, Nahida Nasreen, Shamir Shah, Fimir okay. Sufi, Naeem Khan. There's such a huge list of people. Raman Malik, I, 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 unfortunately, your audio is not coming through very clearly. And, and we do need to talk about several issues. The clock is against us. And I, I, as I said, I do want to give equal time to everybody. We need to speak about something very important here, because one of the reasons that so many accuse the BJP of trying, of revoking Article 370, the purpose of it being, was to change the very demographics of Kashmir, to make it no longer a Muslim-majority state. So in the three years, Moeed, let me direct this to you. Have non-Kashmiris been buying the land that the native Kashmiris were fearing? Are demographics actually changing? Andrea, uh, I think Mozammal will be able to answer this with more statistics. We do not get any accurate information in Islamabad about the uh, way things have shaped since 2019. Initially, for almost several months, there was a total blackout. When we try to talk to the Kashmiri journalist on the ground. They say they cannot talk because their telephones are monitored. Uh, the only way we can understand what's happening in Kashmir is through Indian publications. I think there's one excellent publication, The Wire. Apart from The Wire, which is launched by Siddharth Varadarajan, we don't get any accurate information or picture of what is really happening there. But we have been hearing these things. We cannot really verify Yes, people have been purchasing land, there have been settlements, uh, and there have been um, ideas like that. So um, I think it's, um, I think you, you can, Mazamal can give you a more accurate statistical uh, picture of that situation. Okay, very quickly, Muzamil, if you have some quick statistics to actually say, but we also have to remember that in basically two of the three years, since Article 370 was revoked, there had been the pandemic. Um, there were hindering economic uh, growth, what, social movement, everything uh, that could have very much affected whether or not the demographics were changed. I mean, should we be prepared for a delay in action whereby we will see land being bought en masse by, by non-native Kashmiris? Uh, before before even the land is, land is purchased, there is something called a domicile certificate, which essentially gives people uh, a permanent residency in, inside Kashmir. Hundreds of thousands have already been issued. It's only a matter of time before uh, uh, post-pandemic and, and uh, um, the economy being in tatters right now in India. Once that's settled down, people will start flooding into Kashmir and purchasing land. We've seen businesses go in there and purchase land. We've seen indigenous people being moved off their own land. Uh, I mean, it's not just about the land. What happened to the, I mean, we're talking about apartheid. What happened to the same India who supported Nelson Mandela and the ANC against apartheid, while the foreign, their own foreign policy stated no country of the world should practice this, and yet now tread the same path and criminalize those who walk on Mandela's path? Remember, until 2008, I think, Mandela was considered to be a terrorist by certain Western countries. Nelson Mandela, and the irony, uh, the irony is, me as well as others have been charged under anti-terror laws in India, the UAPA, for what? Resisting occupation, exposing India's crimes and settler colonial plans to force demographic change, speaking out against fake and staged encounters, highlighting the RSS agenda for expansionism, promoting human right, the right to life, the rights of religious freedom, the right to self-determination promised to us. I've had a sustained campaign against myself and been demonized for nearly two, two years uh, by India's own mainstream and their government, as well as the alternative media. And as a consequence, this is the most important thing, our families suffer. They're harassed, tortured, okay. and even murdered. This is an eyewitness, this has happened to my family. It's not going to break us. If anything, it's strengthened our resolve. Okay. Uh, Roman Malik, I have to ask, as for the right to, you know, self-determination or at the very least equal representation, there had been talk about voting for a general assembly uh, in 2022, and we're now hearing that may happen in 2024. The suspicion among some, though, is that the BJP doesn't want the election because they fear they could, they could lose badly. What do you say to that? Let's let's understand who are talking. A state which has been occupied by the army, Islamabad, is talking about democracy. Now, that's a joke. But one has to understand what we are doing here. We are giving a proper platform for exercising your franchise without the fear of gun. And 
let the people determine what they want to do. Oh, and secondly, people not staying in Kashmir who are runaway cowards, they are trying to give sermon. It's like the devil telling what is, in, uh, you know, how not yeah, which to is sin. why you locked up Masrat Alam, why you locked up Asiya Andrabi, why you locked up Qasim Faktu, why you lock up Yasin Malik, why you lock up Nahid al why you lock up Shibir Shah, why you lock up Fahim the Sufi, why you lock up Mehim Khan, how many more, why you killed Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani sahab, why you killed Ashraf Sahrai sahab. Okay, uh, Moeed, sorry, I, I, quickly I'll uh, do finish okay. Rahman because so, Andre, Moeed, I, can I needed in. to get to Moeed as well, go ahead Rahman Malik. Okay. Uh, Andre, I just want, quickly want to respond to, to, to some no, of the uh, points uh, which Mr. Uh, Raman, Moed, give, uh, give Raman, Raman one more minute no, and I, I, will, I will let you finish. Uh, Raman, do finish your statement as, within a minute's time, please. My simple submission here is, I know before coming to this uh, debate, there is going to be a, a, a bias of sorts in mind of people who are coming and uh, saying things. But let me be very clear. We are a country governed by a constitution. It is not a khalifa. We are a country which has elections, a Supreme Court, which functions very well. And as oh, per yes, really uh, well. the gentleman who London and talking about Indian economy, let me tell him very clearly, we are the only country, according to Reuters report, which has just been released. I do not know whether he reads or not, because most of the Pakistani and the Kashmiri operated Pakistanis, they do not read this. That India is the only country Do you have which has been given a zero percentile chance of going into a recession That's in the top eight okay. economies but of the world. But we're not talking now, so much about India as we're talking about the states do not and status of the, what was the autonomous agenda, region, and we region of Kashmir. So it is a completely over... different context. Uh, I'm sorry, Moeed, I promise Andrea, I would if I get... can come in. Go ahead. Uh, 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 Andrea, you know, I am always looking for solutions. I am a Kashmiri. I understand and I have said it in the outset that both New Delhi and Islamabad have done serious blunders and atrocities against each other and against the Kashmiris and Kashmiris are paying the price for it. Well, uh, quite contrary to what Raman says, we are very appreciative of the Indian progress, of the Indian democracy. We appreciate Indian economy as well. But these offer no solution to the plight of the Kashmiris in Kashmir. So when he talks of, you know, uh, bandits being killed and all that, I mean, statistics, which the Indian statistics in South Asian sites show, then more than 100,000 people have actually died in Kashmir since 1989 insurgency. And a, a very small number of them are Hindus or Pandits, and the great majority of the people that died in Kashmir are Kashmiri people, or they have been the various kind of insurgents that have been killed by the Indian security apparatus. For instance, the Guardian story and the research by the human rights groups of 2009 show that only in the two, in the three districts of Kashmir, there were 9,000, more than 9,000 unmarked graves. There were mass graves, right? To this day, the Indian establishment, the New Delhi has not really uh, been able to explain that. And yes, we are not very appreciative. There is a huge change uh, in Pakistan, which Mr. Raman is not uh, not aware of, that Pakistani people are not necessarily agreeing with their establishment on any issue of the history right now. So this is a great opportunity for any intelligent person in New Delhi uh, to basically see how we can find solutions. And then the solution for the Kashmir lies in Kashmir. It is Pakistan can only provide some inspiration. Uh, I think the Pakistani establishment and the governments are not really interested in Kashmir anymore. Yes, they have. They keep on saying it's uh, we are a stakeholder. It's a principal issue. But uh, uh, as an independent journalist, I can I can I can clarify that the solution lies in Kashmir and solution lies in India in a constitutional framework. And August fifth is an atrocity. Uh, August 5th, 2019 is a disaster uh, in terms of fixing things. And we're very interested in having good relationship with India. Uh, Moeed, I'm glad you at least have some sense of optimism there and that you think there are solutions. But do, would you agree, I mean, we only have 30 seconds left, that there still is this risk of armed conflict breaking out in the region and descending into war? Unfortunately, yes, uh, because of the human rights situation, because of the because of the fundamental problem in the legal framework uh, which New Delhi has imposed, even India's other secular parties like Congress would not have necessarily uh, gone to the extent. So there is an ideological problem uh, which is growing in India. And what happened on 5th August is relates to that intellectual and ideological flawed plan and problem that is thrusting India in a direction. Okay. Moid Pirzada, Muzamil Ayub Takar, and Rahman Malik, I'd like to thank all three of you really so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers.
Greatly appreciated. Our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore newsmakers. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.